Thank you very much, Tim, and thank you all very much for coming back from coffee. But this is the attraction of the day. <laughs> you sort of, you've made it through, you know, how we scrutinise phase one, how we're going to scrutinise phase two. But actually, we all know that the only people we really want to hear from is our phenomenal panel of parliamentary sketch writers who've torn themselves away from the box office show that is Mark Sedwell, proving that he is played <laughs> by Nigel Hawthorne and uh, at, the, at PACAC, available as live tweeted by the committee. Uh, but anyway, but we're going to talk a bit about the role of the sketch writer in the, uh, the Brexit process. So I've got a fantastic panel uh, going from my far left, John Crace from The Guardian. I hope that's how you pronounce it, it's not Cratchit or something. Yeah, yeah, Italian, no, is it? yeah. Anyway. <laughs> no, we're all no Italian this day. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah. that's why he's a long way away. <laughs> then we've got Michael <laughs> Deacon from The Telegraph. <laughs> and then next to me, Tom Peck from The Independent. So, uh, Tom just said to me, it's all been such a blur, he can't think about anything that happened in the last three years. So, Tom, <laughs> uh, what was the standout moment for you from the last three years of Brexit? Well, it's a, truly a pleasure to be asked that first, because I've got no doubt that Michael and John are likely, if they think about it, to say exactly the same. And that would be Theresa May's conference speech from 2017, which... Um, it was just such a rolling, you know, WTF gasm that you couldn't really. Pos as, as a sketch writer, I just think days like that come along once in a lifetime. <laughs> but but at the same time, you were and, and Michael says this quite. Well, we all say this quite often. It was a day when you are reduced to the role of transcriber, where you don't, you just write down what happened in order. Um, but but I mean, when her voice gave way, we like all the journalists, you get given the copy of the speech. Like, as she goes onto the stage, they, they, bring, they circulate the copies around. I'm sure you, lots of you guys would have been there. And the voice goes, and you're just... Oh, my God, there There's is a, a long way of this to go. <laughs> and you sort of... Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen here. And then in the end, it just sort of became agonising to the point where I don't think... I didn't even notice the fact that the backdrop had collapsed at the end. Um, yeah. But just, a, just a, a, a thing of total wonder. OK, Michael, is that your best moment as well? Uh, no, well, I, um, oh. I, I choose different ones because you know, I think there's a golden rule of uh, sketch writing in the last ten years, and that is if Nigel Farage is doing anything at all, you go. <laughs> so, for example, uh, January the 30th this year, the day before Brexit, um, I was um, I was actually the only journalist there for some reason, but I was in the uh, sort of like the attic of a restaurant in Soho where Nigel Farage was unveiling a portrait of himself <laughs> titled Mr. Brexit and Jim Davidson gave a speech in his honour. Now, <laughs> you can't more that. Um, but that's not even the best Nigel Farage moment. I'm not sure that's in the best top, in my top ten Nigel Farage moments. The best one still is the Battle of the Tens uh, from... June, uh, wasn't it? it was June 2016, and I was on board a fishing boat with Nigel Farage as we were being chased in circles round the Thames by Bob Geldof on a pleasure cruiser uh, with a loud hailer shouting rude words about Nigel Farage. Um, and I remember a particular moment when we sailed under, I think it was Blackfriars Bridge, and there were about a hundred people out there, just passes by, passes by who'd stopped to watch, and they all started singing Rule Britannia. <laughs> and I have to say, it's been downhill ever since. Nothing has ever happened like that, and I feel I should probably have retired there. Anyway. Okay, John. Um, well, I'm going to be very dull, in fact, and go back, because my favourite memory was, in fact, Tom's as well because it was one of those complete car crash events where if you were writing a sitcom, you wouldn't dare include it all. Um, <laughs> because you just think, this is just unbelievable. I mean, from the moment the stand-up comedian Stephen Brodkin turns up and hands her a P45, <laughs> and she accepts it. <laughs> I mean, I'm really, I mean, because, you know, sort of deep down, that's what she really wanted. <laughs> and at that moment, she starts sort of losing her voice. And this was her voice's way of trying to distance herself from everything that was going on. It was a sort of psychosomatic breakdown. And, you know, then she was sort of 
Philip Hammond gives her a cough sweet, and she, she looks at it and not wondering whether it's poison. <laughs> <laughs> and hoping that it is. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and you can see that sort of she'll, part of her is thinking, Am I, should I just go on, or should I kind of cut my losses? And she carries on because she can see all the naked ambition in the cabinet. Sort of. <laughs> and then literally the sort of scenery starts falling apart <laughs> at the end. I mean, literally her world collapsing. And it was one of those ones where I was just sitting there through the thing. And it was, as we say, it just <laughs> well, became think, straight well, reportage. That's, that's the thing, I don't know whether I'm being even more pompous than usual, but I didn't find that event all that funny. I found it quite painful watching it. It's a total humiliation from start yeah. to finish. And I, I felt honestly bad for her. And that's, that's one of the things about <laughs> Theresa May. And in a way, it's what makes her a really good uh, character to write about, for a sketch writer anyway, is that she had pathos. And I think that that's what, you know, that's, that's what... Um, you need in a, in, in a sketch. Like Ed Miliband was a great uh, character yeah, to write yeah. about because he had pathos. And it's a bit like, you know, you know, all the great sitcom characters, you think about people like, you know, Tony Hancock and Basil Fawlty, David Brennan, Partridge, Rigsby, all those people. They've all got something in common, which is, which is pathos, which is that they have grand ambitions that you know that they will never, ever achieve. It's something above their station and they will never be able to reach it. So it means you're not just laughing at them, you can feel for them at the same time. There's an essential tragedy there. And Ed Miliband had that. Um, and Theresa May had that. Um, I think Jeremy Corbyn doesn't. I'm less interested in Jeremy Corbyn because there isn't that sense of pathos with him because no. you know, he only became Labour leader at the age of 65. You don't feel that he'd had that ambition all his life that he'd wanted to be the most powerful person in the land or anything like that. So when he failed, I feel it's not, it's not going to hurt him personally. No. So we know and that Boris is... Johnson had had this ambition all his life. So where does Boris Johnson fit into your sort of... Notion well, well, of pathos. He, I mean, he should we laugh at Boris because, because he's been surfing this endless wave of luck for his entire career. <laughs> <Therefore, there's laughs> pathos yet. Maybe when he fails, although maybe he's well, had they're, so much they're... luck already and things yeah. have gone so well for him all the time that you, you won't Except feel there's, there's a... any poignancy when he eventually does fail. There's a if different myth with Johnson. Yeah. Maybe no more. Tom. Well, there's a different myth with Johnson in the sense that nothing's ever gone wrong for him. He's now got to be sort of more of a King Midas type myth, isn't it? Oh. In the sense that he's now got his uh, life's ambitions, except for the fact he's got this terrible virus to deal with. He's way out of his depth. Brexit is going to be a far more serious proposition. The, the, the bad bit is going to be on his watch. And loads of him to get too into his personal life. He is, doesn't give the air of a man who necessarily wants to have two policemen standing outside his bedroom door every night um, <laughs> making sure he's in there. <laughs> um, that does seem to be a bit of a recurrent yeah. theme from the sketch writers <laughs> about Boris Johnson or whatever. What about Johnson in Parliament, John? I mean, you know, he... We always assume, because he was funny on how I got news for you, that he'd just walk it in Parliament. But actually, no, he he's has, not very good, is no, he? No, he has struggled and stumbled. And I don't know whether that is because so much of what he does is an act. You, mm. know, he, you know, it's a part of being Boris Johnson, really. Um, I mean, I, I think the great sort of question that sort of... I, you know, I try and kind of explore, you know, Michael talks about trying to find an inner world there. I mean, I've always thought that Boris wanted to become prime minister and he never actually wanted to be prime minister, so particularly. Like Brexit, and, you know, I, I was at the number 10 press conference yesterday, the sort of second emergency press conference to reassure everyone. I mean, I find an emergency press conference particularly unreassuring. <laughs> um, but Boris looked absolutely kind of terrified there. Um, a week ago, when he had done the first one, there was a bit of jollity. You know, he'd made a few laughs and also kind of few gaffes about shaking hands with coronavirus mm. patients and stuff like that. But yesterday, it suddenly it looked as if everything was weighing on his shoulders and it just wasn't that much fun anymore. And that the realities of being Prime Minister, making really tough decisions, and being on duty from sort of six in the morning to 11 at night with every 15 minutes of your time 
carefully policed just isn't Boris. It's well, not what he signed up for. Yeah, I, I exactly agree. I've, I've never seen why I want to be PM, because fundamentally it's a miserable job, and sooner or later everyone will hate you, and I don't think he's someone who's necessarily equipped to be uh, hated. I always thought the ideal job for him was the one he had as Mayor of London, because that yeah. is mm. maximum publicity and minimum responsibility, which I did. That looks, actually looked like a fun job, certainly, at that time. Mm. <laughs> Prime Minister, no, it's not going to be fun for long, surely. I don't think it's fun now. Um, I think the, with Boris Johnson spent, he's 55, which is one of the m a higher age to become Prime Minister than has become normal in recent times. Mm. There are, there are ex an exception. I think he spent longer than he thought it would take him mm. to get his entitled destiny. Mm. And he spent too long sort of playing the Joker, if you like, and now he has become the Joker, mm. which perhaps if he'd been Prime Minister 10 years ago, he may not have been. But he's, he's, sort of, he's sort of stuck with this, you know, if, you're, if you spend too long wearing a mask, you internalise mm. it and all, and all that stuff. And I think he sort of, he, he can't do serious. Maybe, maybe he would have been able to a while ago, but you know, in the London riots, he was a disaster. Like a very good cheerleader for London, a very good cheerleader for the London Olympics. I mean, uh, it's pretty well known that when he was stuck on the zip wire during the Olympics, it's because he specifically asked for too many weights to be put into his harness, knowing that it would happen. Um, um, so it's so a very, very, very effective joker, but it's completely out of his depth whenever there's anything serious to be done. And as such, he's, he has never been... I mean, the three of us could have, would have, could have told anybody a long time ago that he's never been a very good House of oh. Commons performer and we're never, we're never expecting him to be because the, the serious register has always been beyond him. Oh. Now, he is a very good speech giver, but his natural audience is sort of... 10 grand a time drunk insurers after dinner, <laughs> if, you, if you know what I mean. Well, uh, the, to, to be the spokesperson of a nation at a serious moment mm. in its life is not in his skill sets. And that's, that's not a crime. It's not in many people's skill sets. But it's, also, it's almost like a sort of a Greek tragedy type curse. The thing that he has lots and lots of talents. He would have been a brilliant journalist, a brilliant pundit, but wants the thing that he's not good at. So I want to go back to the bit of the process. But first of all, I mean, who were the surprise sort of breakout stars of the Brexit process? Who did you think sort of <laughs> emerged from the process that you, if you've been sitting there in 2016 thinking, you know, well, I don't expect very much from them, but whatever. John? Well, I'm going to counterintuitively go for Chris Grayley. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because... <laughs> For me, he was just the, he was the breakout star. I mean, the failure's failure, really. Um, and I mean, if you were looking for someone who was going to really screw things up, um, he kind of sort of managed it. And it was sort of, I mean, maybe there's a sort of hint of cruelty in me here, that, but I kind of watched him visibly kind of disintegrate. And uh, he, he developed <laughs> this twitch that just sort of... And his, his cheek used to wobble like this at the dispatch box as he tried to sort of say that, that the best way, you know, he, employing a 13... giving a handing over a £13 million pound contract to a ferry company with no ferries. And, and, and Chris Grading was capable of arguing that that proved that this was the perfect, you know, that he was on top of preparations. <laughs> because if he wasn't, if he genuinely thought, he, you know, he was unprepared, he would have given the ferry com contract to a ferry company with ferries. Um, uh, I mean, there was a sort of lot of very average performers, but in terms of pure comedic sketch material, I mean, I always found Chris Grayling absolutely unmissable. Michael, you're not looking as though you're convinced by Chris Grayley. Well, no, no, it's just I'm, I'm feeling sorry for him now. <laughs> <laughs> Never had before. You're making me feel for this guy. Um, my my favourite would be Mark Francois, who I think is the absolute perfect embodiment of the, the Brexit id, really. <laughs> he's fantastic. He's wonderful. I mean, he's a, an angry pork pie, basically. <laughs> not, not so much these days. Now, now he's, he's more of a jubilant pork pie. You know, yeah. Sort of... Uh, Pork pie in Excelsis, really. But still, is, still angry, though. Let's face it, he won. This is, this is his yeah. country now. This is him. He is the, you know... And he's won his right to be angry. Yeah. He's angry forever. Tom, who's yours? Um, well, Frank Johnson, the former, long-time former Telegraph sketchwriter, used to talk about being, being a sketchwriter as being, um, like, panning for, for flecks of gold in a dirty river. And obviously, the, for us, the last few years have just been, like, the days of rivers of gold. I mean, it's just been all gold. Um, and, of course, he wants to know who the star is. And, of course, the star for people like us is the person for whom things most go wrong. Mm. 
Um, it's not, you're not sort of looking to admire anyone. And I guess, um, I mean, two great answers, but I guess Jacob Reese mogg but, but for a particular reason, and that is because Brexit has revealed him to be just a ridiculous, lightweight, um, ineffective, um, bogus charlatan, essentially. And I think, I, think, I, think, I think a few years ago, he would, he would be someone who, you know, everyone's crying out for authenticity and they didn't really mind his, um, the fact that he was sort of like a PJ Woodhouse cosplay character because they thought that that was his authentic identity and he was brave enough to wear it. And actually, he was very intelligent and he'd made loads of money and, and he was being frozen out of the Tory party because they were scared of him. And I think Brexit, so many people in Brexit, what Brexit has done to such a large extent is allow lots and lots of people to expose themselves as, the, as being not what they are, <laughs> as being not all that they are cracked up to be. And I think Jacob Rees-Mogg is, 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 your, is your best answer on that yeah. front. I mean, can I yeah. just come in on this? Because, I mean, I think Mark Frostwell and Jacob Rees-Mogg are great examples. But in a way, they are sort of... It's the, it's the great... I mean, part of the pleasure of sketch writing and also the pain has just been to watch sort of positions sort of change. I mean, we've had Boris Johnson sort of come back and say, I've negotiated a new deal, when we all know that actually he's just plucked a deal that Theresa May had pre previously rejected, and which he had gone to the DUP conference and publicly rejected himself. And which the ERG, you know, Jacob Rees-Mogg and Marc Francois said they could never possibly support. And yet, you know, we're all supposed to sort of have a complete mind blank at this point and, you know, forget everything. We return to a tabula rasa whereby suddenly it is a great, great new deal and you get the sort of Marc Francois and Jacob Rees-Mogg portraying themselves as sort of utter lightweights of real, sort of no real integrity in having stood up for the DUP, rightly or wrongly. They just sort of threw them under a bus quite happily mm. and, you know, don't think twice about them. Michael, do you want to have any comments on John's analysis there, since I think... <laughs> it's all totally correct. <laughs> <laughs> so part of this, so we talked about the people who've obviously populated this landscape, um, but actually, the process yeah, is really quite complicated of the process of, sort of Parliament scrutinising Brexit, Section 13, humble address. How mm. on earth did you actually manage to educate your readers about what was going on? Tom? Yeah, so I always have a bit of a rule, which is if my sort of non-politically engaged old school mates won't understand something that I've written, then it has to be changed. Um, and sometimes it was impossible not to break that rule, especially in sort of weird um, late night debates. Um, and I mean, there was one occasion where the chief whip was sort of running around after Tory MPs and then Stephen Barclay came out and had he proposed this motion and then voted against it himself. <laughs> and, and it was, and it was, um, it was sort of, and you're sort of staring at, the, staring at the events in front of you and you think you just about understand them. And then you've got to try and explain them to someone who has not had the privilege of sitting in that room watching it all for God knows how long. Um, and it can, it can be difficult, but um, in some ways we are liberated from the necessity to actually tell people what's happened, because other people in the paper do that. And um, I find if something's too... If, 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 you've, if you're doing five parts of explanation just for your punchline at the end, then it has to be a pretty good punchline. <laughs> Michael, do you feel? Yeah, well, exactly that, yeah. I mean, if you've got 500 words, yeah. there's no point even really explaining what an SO24 thingy is, you know. All you've got to do is just say, well, look, the, last night they all voted against every possible form of Brexit and against stopping yeah. Brexit, you know. You're just <laughs> throwing out the air. That's what, that was one of the most yeah. dispiriting things about that, that whole period, was so many procedural games and obscure rules that hadn't been heard of since mm -hmm. about 1723 or whatever. And then, you know probably never be heard of again now. Mm -hmm. We've probably, you know, I, I'm not quite sure even I can remember what an SO24 is. It was incredibly important and historic and momentous at the time. <laughs> and now I think... I think John Baker's, John Baker's <laughs> coming later, so you can ask the yeah, question. Yeah, I might have to, what is yeah. SO24, and why do you actually have to call it S, capital S, capital O, number 24 or whatever, mm. which we got very into where I was working then. John, do you feel the need to explain what was going on, or did you just say, oh, they can read everything else, they come to me for the laughs? Pretty much the latter, though I, my, my own particular rule was that 
I at least had to understand it myself. <laughs> and for that, I was terribly lucky in that we've got sort of, I'm sure many of you follow Andy Sparrow's live blog on, at The Guardian. And literally, if, if there, there is sort of nothing he doesn't remember, there is nothing that he doesn't understand about parliamentary procedure. And many is the time in the last 18 months when I've had to come go to him and say, Andy, did this really happen? <laughs> I mean, you know, have I misinterpreted what I've been watching? I mean, can they have really been that stupid? <laughs> and he said, yeah, no, John, they are that stupid. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's absolutely fine. And so I've kind of just felt free to write the sketch then. <laughs> So we've just had a panel where everybody's sort of saying, actually, this is a government that's not very keen on scrutiny. The Prime Minister sort mm. of, in, you know, seems to have uh, lost his reply to liaison committee in the post. Hasn't arrived yet. <laughs> um, not very keen on turning up, Parliament being ignored. So do you think you as sketch writers actually play a role in scrutiny? Michael, do you see yourselves having a sort of, any sort of higher purpose than no, just being light be, relief? No, I would feel very, I would feel very self-important saying that, I think. I mean, I hate, I hate the word satire, by the way. Satire is such a, a pompous word, implying that I, I know best, you know. It, it implies superiority. And I, 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 I just write jokes, you know. Um, I don't think there's more... To, you know, if I, if I start, you know, sort of waffling on about how important and I am in the business of, you know, analysing and scrutinising the executive, then I think I'll start sounding like the kind of person who needs to be satirised myself. So, no, I wouldn't. I think that's far too... <laughs> pompous and grand, really. Tom, is that the same um, for you? No, yes and no. I mean, I, I certainly agree that I would, no, I would always describe myself as a piss-taker rather than a satirist. Um, and I, I do think that, um, that we, are, we don't, we are, we, we don't have to follow the same rules that news reporters mm. have to follow. We are, no one is putting any pressure on me to make sure there's balance or to make mm. sure that both sides are representative. If I want to just relentlessly rip the take the mickey out of the same person day after day after day after day, <laughs> after day after day, then I will. And if I'm right, eventually, hopefully, enough people will see it um, because, it, because, there's, because there's so much of it. And, I, and definitely people, um, I mean, in a printed newspaper, it's, it's, it's various studies that, that newspaper groups do. It's pretty well known that lots of people buy a newspaper and turn to the sketch first. So you are serving a purpose there for sure mm. because people like jokes and, and, if, it, and if, if it then draws them into the more serious stuff, that's another outside... But it's not necessarily. But it's definitely the case that if you, um, David Mitchell always says that he became a comedian because he felt that it was the cleverest thing to do. If you can make a joke about something, mm. then you're doing. Then you're then you're providing an analysis of it that perhaps other people can't. And I certainly think that you can expose rid ridiculousness, expose hypocrisy very effectively by making people laugh at it. And lots of politicians don't like it when you do that to them. So there, so it definitely has a role in that front. Yeah. John, do you think um, you're holding the government to account. Well, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe I'm more pompous than I want to admit. Uh, um, I mean, I kind of think the sketch is a continuum, really. Uh, when I first... I, I, I took over in early 2014, when Simon Hoggart died, and back then, sort of, politics was much more of a niche product, really. I mean, the sort of readership of the sketch was much smaller, and the... the Issues that were at stake didn't seem so sort of so pressing, really. And I can remember sort of often thinking, oh, God, it's Thursday, it's transport questions. I'm going to have to make a sort of gag about somebody wanting a roundabout on Kettering or something like that. But I think Brexit did up the ante, really, mm. and suddenly politics became much more serious for a lot of people. And um, I can't pretend that there isn't a lot of anger to my humour as well. Um, and, I mean, whether that's just a sort of form of therapy for myself, really, or whether it is... I mean, I, I, I don't think you know, I'm some sort of figure holding the government personally to account, but I do feel like it does help with my mental health. You know what I mean? <laughs> the, just to have a forum where I can say, look what's going on. I mean, this is just mad. So it's quite notable last week when Michael Gove made his statement on the future relationship that if you looked 
This was actually quite a big parliamentary occasion, in theory, setting out what mm. the UK wanted out of this long-term relationship. And it looked pretty empty. A Labour spokesman who I hadn't impinged on me before turned up rather than Keir <laughs> yeah. Starmer, stuff like that. I mean, it's basically this not going to be stuff you write about anymore over the coming year because actually Parliament's interest has just waned in it? Well, I don't know. I mean, in a way, I think that's why you have to keep... You know, the sketch sort of does fulfil a function of... I mean, just expose... I mean, since the general election, I mean, looking at the Labour benches, they are half empty most of the time. And the ones that are there look like they're suffering from PTSD still. Right? Yeah, they're like, they're like sort of like a row of deflated yeah. footballs. You know? Yeah. <laughs> All the air has gone out of the debate. You know, when you had a, effectively a hung mm. parliament, you know, then there was a purpose to this conflict and mm. all the desperation and anger. And now they're just utterly defeated. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've only, I started this, doing the sketch in November 2015, so I have essentially only known You've the... You've only had the good times. Yeah, the, yeah. the, the, the proper, like, crack cocaine years. Mm. <laughs> and I mean, so so there's like um, when Parliament was hung, and it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if it's about Brexit. Hung Parliament's find life difficult, and you find it very difficult if you're trying to do something very difficult like Brexit. And now you you have a very very you have a, a comfortable majority, and it will be harder for us to find where our where our mileage is, if you like. But one of the upsides, if you like, is that the entire Conservative Party intake, and especially the the cabinet, was hand picked for its own either pliants or uselessness in the, in the, in the sense that the, the, the buy-in price of being a Tory MP, and, the, and that, the evidence of that is the ones that were got rid of in 2019, is that you have to be willing to go along with this idea that most of the Parliamentary Conservative Party considered to be terrible right up until the 23rd of June 2016. So there will be mileage there, in, in, in especially some of the new intake, um, some of the Cabinet Ministers who, would, who will just go along with this because, because they're being told to so I think that will be the new um, the, so who's, the fertile who's on your watch list of who should we, we be sort of, you know, who's the Marc Francois in waiting who's going to emerge in this parliament if you spotted anyone in the new intake so we could hear that, it that, here that, first that's a very high bar Marc Francois yeah. I, don't dare, <laughs> I, don't, I don't dare to dream but I, 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 a good character so far is um, Steve Baker well, I was thinking on the Labour bench is Zara Sultana, who is... Yeah. Uh, OK, mm, yeah, she's already made a name she, She's the new Pidcock. She is, you know, a true believer in Corbynism, and I think she used her maiden speech to denounce the last Labour government as Thatcherites. So yeah. I think <laughs> yeah. there's, there's a future for her, a big future for her yeah. head. She'll probably be leader. In, um, no, I think, so, I, think, I think you're right to pick up on Steve Baker, actually, because, I mean, Steve Baker, from having gone to... from being sort of chair of the ERG and permanent thorn in the side of sort of the Tory government for the last sort of three years is now falling, you know, he's resigned as chair because, you know, he... Was, it's it, done, John. It, it's, yeah, but he knows it's not done. And, you know, even now, you know, when there are a few sort of Tory rebels sort of, uh, sort of making trouble over Huawei this afternoon, Steve has carefully tweeted today... I will be backing the government. And you can kind of see that this is a man who is trying to ease his way back to a sort of ministerial level. And it's just sort of... I'm interested to see how many of his principles he can betray to get there, really. <laughs> Tom, who are you watching out for? Um, Suella Braveman's going to be good mileage, I reckon. I, mean, I, think, well, I think it was John said about her a couple of weeks ago that she's, like, like many people, is um, sort of frighteningly unaware of her own limitations <laughs> um, and this this that she she's going to go after the independent judiciary because she doesn't really seem to be bright enough to understand that that is a terribly bad idea and not something that any functioning um government in a in a functioning developed first world country ever does because it's nuts so that that that, 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 that is one of their many projects and i think there will and be, she was a lawyer herself right yep right. yep yeah. yep, yep. I but that's no bar. Does use the phrase it? cultural Marxism at the dispatch yeah, okay. box without yeah. realising it was sort of a broadly anti Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Let's go and see if there's some questions from the audience. Uh, so I think there's a roving mic. Yeah, we've got somebody right at the back there. Capture. Yeah. Very quick questions. Do a quick fire round. Yes, yeah. uh, Jack Meek, Thompson Reuters. I was just wondering, considering that the, uh, during the May and Corbyn years, it was like a battle of the embittered uh, geography teachers across the dispatch box. Purely from a sketch writing point of view, who would you like to see win 
the Labour leadership, so nothing to do with their quality. Very, just glad. In terms Very glad of you points. asked that. That was definitely on my list. So, who's going to be the most box office? Are you salivating for Starmer versus Bojo? No, um, they're none of them are that box office, are they? Um, but no, they, they weren't last time round either. I think I think Keir Starmer might do a more effective job at making Boris Johnson look ridiculous, and that will make our job slightly easier. If you'd had to pick mm. from all, apart from Zara Sultana, who? An entire sort of Labour Party. I mean, would Jess Phillips have been? Well, well, Who would you have really liked? Well, there you. I land in my. You, I'm conflicted yeah. between wanting to live in a functioning country and also wanting things to be terrible for the sake of my own job. We do have a conflict of interest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We do. The answer. The answer is Richard Bergen, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I really feel he, he's really undersold himself. I'm going for deputy. I, I think if he'd gone for leader, he might have won. <laughs> Well, you never know. He might, he might just sort of make it yet. Um, he might sort of sneak up on the rails. Why not? You know, uh, Keir will resign over some major scandal and then Richard Bergen steps up. I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I'm very much with Tom. You know, there is a sort of conflict between what I want for the country and <laughs> what I want for my own career. I mean... <laughs> Uh, I, I, I mean, Keir isn't great box office to sketch, but there is something quite reassuring about the forensic way, about um, the way he kind of questions and sort of digs down, really. And, you know... I, tell you, I mean, So I was just going to say, yeah, the difference with, with Starmer and Corbyn at PMQs Starmer will not only ask better questions, but he will actually listen to the answers that are being given to him, which I yeah. don't think Corbyn does. Honestly, I think at the moment Boris Johnson could announce his resignation in the middle of an answer, <laughs> and Corbyn would just look down at his list of questions and just ask whatever's written next about <laughs> bus routes in Bolivia or whatever. Yeah. He, would just, he would just be totally... No, he wouldn't I, register it at all. And I mean, well, it's quite cute for him. Maybe the Prime Minister should try that and yeah. see. I mean, <laughs> worth a go, worth a go. I mean, Corbyn had a sort of major hit two weeks ago when he started calling Boris the sort of part-time Prime Prime Minister, and I could have sworn that he'd nicked that from all of our sketches because we, because we've been calling him the part-time Prime Minister for, sort of for ages. Still so, takes Lou days as well, Corbyn. I think doesn't he? Yeah, quite, he still takes Lou days for the allotment. From but from what? <laughs> not, not enough. Lou days. <laughs> Did they ever ask you to help with jokes? Have any of you been sort of, you know, asked in? We had a Brexit comedy event or whatever, where I think someone said they were approached by by possibly Ed or possibly David Miliband to write really? jokes for Who them. Who was that? Uh, I think that was, was that Nish? I think or sort of like one of the yeah. panellists, one of the male panellists oh. then, oh, not, asked, um, had been asked, approached. No, 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 none of okay. them. Should, should I be insulted? Or? I don't know, I think you probably should. But anyway, there's an opportunity there for any aspiring leader who wants jokes written for them. <laughs> Let's have another question. She said, looks around. Or not. Zero questions, they've got to be. Yes. Let's just Brian wait. Walker Brian, just wait ABC. for the Brian, Brian well, microphone. Well, I'm shouting loud enough. Uh, no, no, <laughs> but you can't be broadcast the nation shouting. Genuinely, honestly, is there anybody you admire and can admit to it? Oh, uh, doesn't that break the special um, act that you've that, all signed in blood to admire somebody? Loads of people. I mean, when I took the job in November 2015, I was genuinely <coughs> conflicted about... Nobody gets involved in, in job, jobs like ours unless they like politics. You don't like politics unless you like some politicians. So I was worried that I would be spending all my time just taking the mickey yeah. out of them. And obviously, as things turned out, it makes me laugh that I yeah. could ever have possibly been worried about that. <laughs> but... Essentially, you have at the it's changing now, but for quite a few years, you just had two parties that had lost simultaneously and being run by its fringes rather than its um, the people that would normally, in the course of events, be running be running things. Um, there's loads of decent politicians on both sides. I mean, the Conservatives name that well, the Conservatives purged all of theirs in 2019, which is unfortunate. You can read the names out if you like. I mean, Labour have got lots and lots of decent. I, I admire Stephen Kinnock, but he but he's, his things have not gone that well for him. Um, there, there's the. I mean, I, I, admired lots, I admired all of the politicians, believe it or not, who joined the Change UK and actually did something and actually said, we are not, I'm not sitting in these dysfunctional parties anymore. I'm going to do something. Obviously, they've now all lost their seats, so, I, so that's not, and I can't give you them as an answer, but there's loads. Yeah, I, I had about, about two weeks last year where I was a, a genuine fan of Rory Stewart, but now he's suddenly come out against listening to expert advice on coronavirus. I'm, I'm <laughs> beginning to wonder now. I put him sort of in the Farage camp, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure, but... Yeah, I, I liked his, his Tory leadership bid, and uh, he never stood a chance. But, yes, that would be one example. John? Yeah, I mean, 
I, I would go the same. I mean, m many people in the Tory party um, have all, as far as I can see, all the good men and women have been purged now. So I'm, I'm, I'm really hard pushed to see any, anyone who kind of really you know, strikes me as having great moral integrity there. But on the Labour benches, I, I can see sort of quite a few. I mean, I, I'm a... I know that sort of Rachel Reeves gets a bad press, but I think she is genuinely bright. She is, uh, and she, I think she has integrity. And I think if Keir Starmer were to make a shadow chancellor, um, I think that uh, Rishi Sunak will have his work cut out. Do you think that what you do sort of does anything to sort of fuel people's contempt for politics. We see sort of trust in politicians at an all-time like we're actually entering a bit of a period where actually it might help if we trusted at least some of them with the coronavirus thing going on. Do you think actually what you do promotes contempt for politicians or does it humanise them or what does it do? I mean I think I think a lot of politicians do a good job of undermining trust in themselves really without any help from us. Um, I, I, I think the as far as I can see, the wider public are more cynical about politicians yeah. than we are, actually. I think they're more contemptuous, if anything. Mm. So I know I'm, I'm, I'm not going to take yeah. the blame for that, I'm afraid. I think, I think the classic idea of our job is to sort of bring down these um, how highly elevated mm. people a little bit. Mm. And in the last few years, that we have, we've essentially had no role yeah. in that. They have brought themselves down <laughs> utterly, almost sort of subterranean-style digging, to the point where they're like waving at the Sydney Opera House. Mm. I mean, it's, we, we've had no role in bringing them down. It's been entirely self-inflicted. OK, we've got one... Oh, we've got some more questions now, but we're heading towards the exit. Let's do a quick whip around. We'll do, go there and then there. And we'll just, uh, we'll just hear the quick questions and then we'll just get everybody to sum up, take whichever they like. Very quick questions. Yes, uh, considering the Conservative leadership uh, election a few months ago, where one admitted smoking heroin, I think... I won't name in case I get it wrong, and another admit taking lines of Charlie. Uh, so how low do you think politicians can go, admit, admit a moral deficiency without... Admit, how low can they go? How low can they go? That's a good question. Would you like to pass that there? And is there another mic? Uh, in, the, <clears throat> in, Paul in the genius category, um, I'm surprised you haven't mentioned the intellectually brilliant and slightly professorial... Andrew Bridgen. <laughs> <laughs> a complete oversight, I think. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. You're right. Okay. Isn't right. Yeah. I won't take that as a question, Andrew Bridgen. <laughs> question mark. Okay, we've got only. Just couple very briefly, of, yeah. um, having spent far too much of my life in the and we're supposed to be thinking about scrutiny today, is there ever any chance that you might wander into committees and take the. Uh, take the measure of them, given that most of the indiscretions and quite a lot of the fun actually take place in them? Um, well, I can answer that because I've always been a big fan of committees um, for sketching them. There has always been... Uh, I, I spent a lot of time in the Brexit Select Committee. I mean, the thing is that sort of since the last election, they haven't really been... They've only just started up again. And... Um, I, I was tuned in to Mark Sedwell this morning, who was giving a great display of not answering questions, really. I think Mark said we're very relieved you've just said that. Yeah, <laughs> final, final question. Uh, Paul, back. Yeah. Um, given the success of Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage, should the opposition parties be looking for a leader who is funny in the future? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so let's take... Do we need funny leaders? Um, success of Farage and Boris Johnson. Is comedy the best way to get on? And also this question about, you know, have we plumbed the depths or can our politicians go any lower? Um, well, <clears throat> I don't think taking each their own, but I'm not sure having once or twice in your life taken illegal substances necessarily is a huge moral failing. I think what did for Michael Gove is the fact that it was dredged up, the fact that he said if any teacher had ever done it, then they'd instantly lose their job. Um, Rory Stewart smoking heroin at a wedding in, a, in Afghanistan. Well, I mean, of course he has. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the question about select committees, I mean, all of us sketch 
select committees all the time. There's, mm. It's quite often there's a little sort of the, the green benches in Portcullis House and you find all five of us squashed onto one of them. That, that mm. happens pretty regularly. Um, Sadly, the biggest mistake I've ever made in my career was spending six hours in a select committee with Philip Green while Michael was on Nigel Farage's flotilla, uh, which, I could, uh, which I could hear out the yeah. window, but it was uh, unable, unable to get out. Farage, the I'm, I'm, I'm afraid it. I was in the same select committee as Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can learn, man. Um, uh, on the subject of funny yeah. leaders, I think given what's happening with coronavirus and the imminent collapse of Western economies, I think we're going to, in about six months' time, we'll probably value funny leaders a little bit less than we did. We might start looking for people who are more serious and competent and know what they're doing and reassuring in that way. So I think that might change and maybe Labour shouldn't worry mm. about that at the, at the moment. In terms of select committees, so who's really good uh, for sketching select committees? Um, Keith Vaz at the, the Home Affairs Select Committee. Those are all very good. I, I don't know what happened to him. <laughs> He, he, was, he was a genuinely brilliant character. There was one year where he gave Simon Hoggart a Christmas present, and his present was a coffee table book he, uh, Keith Vaz had produced himself about his own career in Parliament called 25 Glorious Years. <laughs> and it was full colour, just the whole thing, hardback, full colour photographs of Keith Vaz meeting minor celebrities <laughs> and just sort of frowning earnestly with constituents, yeah. the whole thing. And I, I don't know what happened to that, but I can't find it. It used to be on Simon's desk and it just vanished. Wow. Because well, I would love a copy myself, yeah. but I think it's too late to ask. There might be an extra bit with some washing machines. <laughs> <laughs> so do we need a funny leader? Well, I mean, I mean, I mean maybe I, I've never found Boris particularly funny. Um, maybe I, you know, have a sort of peculiarly sort of undeveloped sense of humour, really. Um, but I've always sort of looked at him as a sort of rather sort of second-rate performer, really. So I, I kind of, I think, like Michael, uh, we will sort of begin to look for people who are more authentic, really. Um, I mean, I think if the humour comes from, it, it feels genuine, then, you know, we can, we will take that from a leader. But if we just think it's some kind of bluster and an act, then uh, I think it's increasingly a redundant property. All right. Well, that possibly is the right slightly downbeat place <laughs> to end what I think has been a terrific session. So could I just ask you all to thank our fantastic panel?